for a conversation on mindfulness, I'm a great example of the totally non-mindful person because I don't have a clue why I'm here. <laughs> I feel like I've sort of mind-wandered into this place. There's going to be a lot of puns after this, okay? I feel I've want, mind-wandered into here because I was actually minding my business very well, and then I got an email from Jochen who has said, you know, I've been, uh, we are a whole bunch of academics who are studying this very serious issue called mindfulness. And I've noticed that you've been giving uh, a few speeches where you mentioned mindfulness in leadership. So could you drop by? So I said, yeah, I'll drop by. So that's what I'm doing now, I'm dropping by. <laughs> but being very mindful of the need to say something, um, I thought what I could do with you was just to share with you from a totally different perspective and bearing in mind that please don't ask me any difficult academic questions because <laughs> I'm going to be very intimidated if you ask me about the literature on this and um, you know, what sort of evidence is there of the uh, efficacy of mindfulness and so on. I just want to share with you how I came to, in my own um, interactions with my colleagues on teachings, on leadership and so on, how I've sort of come to use this term as a layman and probably as a person, an Asian who has been, I wouldn't say I'm a practicing Buddhist, but as someone who's been brought up uh, within Buddhist literature and Buddhist traditions, how the concept of mindfulness in Buddhism has sort of affected why I use the term and why I use it in what I do. And that's about all I can, I can share with you. Um, my interest in this whole topic of mindfulness, particularly in leadership, I think start, has sort of originates from three different directions. The, the first one is that I find it particularly interesting to talk about leadership with young people rather than with cynical old CEOs. So I don't spend much time with that. Instead, I spend it with young people. In fact, I just came back from a, uh, uh, a, a conference at West Point where we engaged with young cadets and other students, and I talked about mindfulness and leadership and found that it resonated with them. I also do quite a number of leadership sessions with my own colleagues in the Bioentry Management Academy, people in their late 20s, early 30s, and it's in the attempt to try to talk about leadership with people who are not president scholars and future ministers, but people who are just going to be leaders in their own little small worlds, I've been challenged to try to find ways to talk about leadership which is meaningful to them. And that's one approach from which I've, I've found mindfulness, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, interesting. The, the second thing is that I've always found it interesting in, in, to the extent that being chairman of SMU, I'm supposed to be a little bit knowledgeable about academic literature. And I find that the literature on leadership um, as practice in business schools is very much influenced by Western sort of social, cultural, ethical traditions. And I think in my own engaging with young Asians, I found that if you go from that angle, much of it, the alpha male kind of uh, syndrome, the aggressive, assertive, individualistic style of leader doesn't really resonate with a lot of young Asians who are by, by instinct perhaps less assertive, more, more sort of uh, collectivist, and more perhaps internally contemplative. So how do I find a way to approach leadership training which is more um, consonant with perhaps Asian social cultural traditions? And that's where I found use the, also the concept of mindfulness, a more contemplative approach to leadership as, a, as opposed to a, re a relatively more assertive Western style approach to leadership. How perhaps that might allow Asians to not only have their, evolve their own form of leadership, but to perhaps also make a contribution to the entire global literature on leadership to the extent that mindfulness as a concept has basically originated from, from Eastern sort of um, philosophical traditions. And finally, my interest in mindfulness and leadership is, originates, I think, out, out of my own views about what are the fundamental attributes of leadership, that in fact, leadership originates not from action, but from your mind and from what you, you think about. So with those three bases, let me first talk about the, the first approach, that is, how do you engage people who are in their 20s, who are not gonna be future presidents and generals and so on, but who are just hopefully going to be leaders in their own little small worlds, how do you talk to them about leadership? And my starting point with young people who've never really experienced levels of, high levels of leadership, is that leadership is all about making difficult decisions. And the biggest obstacle to making a difficult decision, whether it be a huge one or a small one, is 
the person looking at yourself in the mirror. In other words, my major point to most young people is that it is your own self, it's your ego, your emotions, that is the biggest obstacle to making a good decision. And that if you are able to remove your own self out of the equation, very often the right answer is staring at you in the face. Um, that's when the whole concept of mindfulness comes into play. And when I was at West Point recently, talking to a, book, a group of 10 people that I had to stay with for the whole day, the first point in talking about leadership was, and these are only people in their 20s, so I asked them, can you think of the most difficult decision you've ever had to make, which was against your own personal inclinations, but which you, you made because you knew it was ultimately the right thing to do because you took yourself out of it. And I related to them my own incident, which I think was my first example of mindfulness. And to the extent that I can remember it so vividly today, even though it was 40 years ago, I think indicates to me how strong that memory and that experience was. And this was when I was just 20, and I was thrown out of Stanford University, and I was accepted immediately to go to Cornell, and I spent probably about one whole day away from everybody, and I was walking around Lake Lagunita, and essentially that was my first, first uh, dilemma as a young person of how to take myself out of the equation and in order to make a right decision. And the sensation of making that decision I recall so well. It was my first experience, I think, of mindfulness to the extent that it was a certain amount of self-detachment. I could even see myself looking down on myself, almost like with a third eye, and seeing myself making a decision where I took my ego out of it and my emotions and everything else. And subsequently, it has become easier to make decisions because every time I encounter a difficult decision, I'm, I mean, I don't meditate and sit there for 20 minutes before I make a decision, but there is this, there is this automatic uh, attempt to enter into a mindful state where you are existentially conscious of everything around you, and when you're existentially conscious of everything around you, the, most thing, the thing you're most conscious about is yourself, that the biggest gorilla sitting in the room is your own self. And if you're aware of that, you take yourself out of it. That, to me, is essentially the, the essence of mindfulness in, in the Buddhist tradition and the essence of mindfulness as an attribute to helping someone become a leader, that you take yourself out of, a, out of, an exam, out of the, the whole situation. I found that this resonated with my younger colleagues because younger colleagues, or with, like I mentioned, the West Point colleagues, because when I ask them to think of examples, they, th they could then easily think of examples where they made difficult decisions and they had to take their own selves out of it. And when you ask them to train themselves to think every time in that mode of thinking, they, I, I found that it was a useful tool. Now, the second thing is, I mentioned earlier, the Western literature is always full of concepts about decisiveness, forcefulness, toughness, etc., as attributes of leadership, but very little about internal self-contemplation. And this style is not particularly relevant to a lot of young, younger Asian leaders who perhaps by nature are not that assertive. So at the same time, mindfulness as a concept, not so much from an academic approach, but perhaps from a more intuitive approach is actually quite, quite uh, common and quite comfortable with many people who have grown up within a sort of oriental philosophical tradition. So I found it very useful to relate to younger people when I talk to them about mindfulness, about taking the self out of the equation and looking at yourself with a certain amount of detachment and with a high degree of existential self-awareness. And the, the conundrum here, of course, is that the higher your level of self-awareness, the higher the ability to take yourself out of that equation. This I found quite useful because from coming from the final direction of, what, of my interest in this is again my concern that not enough young people are aware, at least in my view, of what constitutes the fundamental attributes of leadership. I don't think it is just initiative, um, but more to do with a high degree of independent thinking, which is tied in also with the, 
with the concept of mindfulness, that being very mindful of yourself, you are thinking for yourself. You're not just following other people. And that leads me to perhaps just a small little digression of an anecdote. I gave a talk, um, I think some years ago, to, the, to a primary school graduation where my son, my youngest son, was graduating from. And you have to remember that primary schools, they're about 12, 13-year-old kids, um, well, a little bit older, the secondary school. And the boys, they're all adolescent. So I asked, and this was a mission school, so it's an all-boys school. So I asked them, um, what is the most, the most liberating and the most dangerous three-letter word in the English language? The boys all said immediately, sex, right? <laughs> the teachers, this is a mission school, said God. <laughs> so they were kind of <laughs> opposing each other. And, and I said the, fo the most liberating and the most dangerous three-letter word is the word why. And that has gotten me into all kinds of trouble uh, because I've asked why uh, to teachers and told to stand in the back of the class. I've asked why to political leaders and gotten into other kinds of trouble. Um, and, but I've always said that the essence of leadership is in the ability to ask why. And leadership is, again, not just manifested by, by a high degree of oratorical skills or by decisiveness, but it's manifested by the ability to think for yourself so that whether it is a Galileo who was clearly an intellectual leader or Isaac Newton, or whether it's Nelson Mandela who's clearly another form of leadership, it's the ability to ask the question why of the status quo and deciding that the status quo ain't correct. And so whether you're a political leader, you're a religious leader, you are a, a thought leader of any kind, the ability to ask why I think is critically important to, to leadership. But that is also tied in with the concept of mindfulness. Unless you are aware that all the action, all the really important action that's going out there in the rest of the world isn't happening out there. It's actually happening in your mind. And it's what's happening in your mind that determines your ability to be a leader. I think once that thought gets through to a lot of younger people, a big sort of jump has been made. Finally, I'd just like to say that um, the idea of mindfulness is something that's actually very, very accepted, I think, in, in the East. I was just in Bangkok reading a, a column in the, um, in the Bangkok Post, uh, written by some Thai person about, about business or whatever. And the, and the headline was, From Mindless Busyness to Mindful Business. So you can imagine, even for in the popular media in Thailand and elsewhere, uh, the whole concept of mindlessness, the whole concept of mindfulness, is already part of everyday conversation. So in that sense, I think it's, uh, my, I guess my last final comment is I would like to congratulate SMU for, for bringing into the academic realm something that probably has been amorphously floating around out there for, for the rest of us, giving it some kind of academic rigor um, and humor along the way. Um, and I suppose, I think it's also very good, speaking as an Asian, that concepts that have been rooted in Eastern philosophical traditions are perhaps making it to a mainstream. And that is perhaps the best thing that SMU also can do, that here in SMU, we can create new forms of thinking, whether it be management thinking, uh, new approaches to leadership, which then allows us to be innovative and unique at the same time. So thank you very much, and I'm mindful that my time is up. Thank you.